Cadman presents Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller, performed by Campbell Scott. Copyright 1961 by Grove Press, Inc. Production copyright 2008 by HarperCollins Publishers. I am living at the Villa Borghese. There is not a crumb of dirt anywhere nor a chair misplaced. We are all alone here, and we are dead. Last night Boris discovered that he was lousy. I had to shave his armpits, and even then the itching did not stop. How can one get lousy in a beautiful place like this? But no matter. We might never have known each other so intimately, Boris and I, had it not been for the lice. Boris has just given me a summary of his views. He is a weather prophet. The weather will continue bad, he says. There will be more calamities, more death, more despair. Not the slightest indication of a change anywhere. The cancer of time is eating us away. Our heroes have killed themselves, or are killing themselves. The hero, then, is not time, but timelessness. We must get in step, a lockstep, toward the prison of death. There is no escape. The weather will not change. It is now the fall of my second year in Paris. I was sent here for a reason I have not yet been able to fathom. I have no money, no resources, no hopes. I am the happiest man alive. A year ago, six months ago, I thought that I was an artist. I no longer think about it. I am. Everything that was literature has fallen from me. There are no more books to be written. Thank God. This, then? This is not a book. This is libel, slander, defamation of character. This is not a book in the ordinary sense of the word. No, this is a prolonged insult, a gob of spit in the face of art, a kick in the pants to God, man, destiny, time, love, beauty, what you will. I am going to sing for you, a little off-key, perhaps, but I will sing. I will sing while you croak. I will dance over your dirty corpse. To sing you must first open your mouth. You must have a pair of lungs and a little knowledge of music. It is not necessary to have an accordion or a guitar. The essential thing is to want to sing. This then is a song. I am singing. It is to you, Tanya, that I am singing. I wish that I could sing better, more melodiously, but then perhaps you would never have consented to listen to me. You have heard the others sing, and they have left you cold. They sang too beautifully, or not beautifully enough. It is the twenty-somethingth of October. I no longer keep track of the date. Would you say, my dream of the 14th November last? There are intervals, but they are between dreams, and there is no consciousness of them left. The world around me is dissolving, leaving here and there spots of time. The world is a cancer, eating itself away. I am thinking that when the great silence descends upon all and everywhere, music will at last triumph. When into the womb of time everything is again withdrawn, chaos will be restored, and chaos is the score upon which reality is written. You, Tanya, are my chaos. It is why I sing. It is not even I, it is the world dying, shedding the skin of time. I am still alive, kicking in your womb, a reality to write upon. Dozing off, the physiology of love, the whale with his six-foot penis in repose, the bat, penis libre, animals with a bone in the penis, hence a bone on. Happily, says Gourmand, the bony structure is lost in man. Happily? Yes, happily. Think of the human race walking around with a bone on. The kangaroo has a double penis, one for weekdays and one for holidays. Dozing. A letter from a female asking if I have found a title for my book. Title? To be sure. Lovely Lesbians. Your Anecdotal Life. A phrase of M. Borowski's. It is on Wednesdays that I have lunch with Borowski. His wife, who is a dried-up cow, officiates. She is studying English now. Her favorite word is filthy. 
you can see immediately what a pain in the ass the Borowskis are. But wait. Borowski wears corduroy suits and plays the accordion, an invincible combination, especially when you consider that he is not a bad artist. He puts on that he is a Pole, but he is not, of course. He is a Jew, Borowski, and his father was a philatelist. In fact, almost all Montparnasse is Jewish, or half-Jewish, which is worse. There's Karl and Paula, and Kronstadt and Boris, and Tanya and Sylvester, and Moldorf and Lucille. All except Fillmore. Henry Jordan Oswald turned out to be a Jew also. Louis Nichols is a Jew. Even Van Norden and Sherry are Jewish. Francis Blake is a Jew, or a Jewess. Titus is a Jew. The Jews, then, are snowing me under. I am writing this for my friend Carl, whose father is a Jew. All this is important to understand. Of them all, the loveliest Jew is Tanya, and for her sake I too would become a Jew. Why not? I already speak like a Jew, and I am as ugly as a Jew. Besides, who hates the Jews more than the Jew? Twilight hour, Indian blue, water of glass, trees glistening and liquescent. The rails fall away into the canal at Jores. The long caterpillar with lacquered sides dips like a roller coaster. It is not Paris. It is not Coney Island. It is a crepuscular melange of all the cities of Europe and Central America. The railroad yards below me, the tracks black, webby, not ordered by the engineer, but cataclysmic in design, like those gaunt fissures in the polar ice which the camera registers in degrees of black. Food is one of the things I enjoy tremendously, and in this beautiful Villa Borghese there is scarcely ever any evidence of food. It is positively appalling at times. I have asked Boris time and again to order bread for breakfast, but he always forgets. He goes out for breakfast, it seems. And when he comes back, he is picking his teeth, and there is a little egg hanging from his goatee. He eats in the restaurant out of consideration for me. He says it hurts to eat a big meal and have me watch him. I like Van Norden, but I do not share his opinion of himself. I do not agree, for instance, that he is a philosopher or a thinker. He is cunt-struck, that's all, and he will never be a writer. Nor will Sylvester ever be a writer, though his name blaze in fifty thousand candle-power red lights. The only writers about me for whom I have any respect at present are Carl and Boris. They are possessed. They glow inwardly with a white flame. They are mad and tone-deaf. They are sufferers. Moldorf, on the other hand, who suffers too in his peculiar way, is not mad. Moldorf is word-drunk. He has no veins or blood vessels, no heart or kidneys. He is a portable trunk filled with innumerable drawers, and in the drawers are labels written out in white ink, brown ink, red ink, blue ink, vermilion, saffron, mauve, sienna, apricot, turquoise, onyx, anjou, herring, corona, verdigris, gorgonzola. I have moved the typewriter into the next room where I can see myself in the mirror as I write. Tanya is like Irena. She expects fat letters. But there is another Tanya, a Tanya like a big seed who scatters pollen everywhere. Or, let us say, a little bit of Tolstoy, a stable scene in which the fetus is dug up. Tanya is a fever, too. Les voies urinaires. Café de la Liberté. Place de Vosges, bright neckties on the boulevard de Montparnasse, dark bathrooms, Porto Sec, Abdullah cigarettes, the Adagio Sonata Pathétique, oral amplificators, anecdotal séances, burnt sienna breasts, heavy garters, what time is it, golden pheasants stuffed with chestnuts, taffeta fingers, vaporish twilights turning to ilex, acromegaly, cancer and delirium, Warm veils, poker chips, carpets of blood, and soft thighs. Tanya says so that everyone may hear, I love him. And while Boris scalds himself with whiskey, she says, Sit down here. Oh, Boris, Russia. What'll I do? I'm bursting with it. At night, when I look at Boris's goatee lying on the pillow, I get hysterical. Oh, Tanya, where now is that warm cunt of yours? those fat, heavy garters, those soft, bulging thighs. There is a bone in my prick six inches long. I will ream out every wrinkle in your cunt, Tanya, 
big with seed. I will send you home to your Sylvester with an ache in your belly and your womb turned inside out. Your Sylvester. Yes, he knows how to build a fire, but I know how to inflame a cunt. I shoot hot bolts into you, Tanya. I make your ovaries incandescent. Your Sylvester is a little jealous now. He feels something, does he? He feels the remnants of my big prick. I have set the shores a little wider. I have ironed out the wrinkles. After me, you can take on stallions, bulls, rams, drakes, St. Bernards. You can stuff toads, bats, lizards up your rectum. You can shit arpeggios if you like, or string a zither across your navel. I am fucking you, Tanya, so that you'll stay fucked. And if you are afraid of being fucked publicly, I will fuck you privately. I will tear off a few hairs from your cunt and paste them on Boris's chin. I will bite into your clitoris and spit out two franc pieces. Indigo sky swept clear of fleecy clouds, gaunt trees infinitely extended, their black boughs gesticulating like a sleepwalker, somber spectral trees, their trunks pale as cigar ash, a silence supreme and altogether European, shutters drawn, shops barred, a red glow here and there to mark a tryst, brusque the facades almost forbidding immaculate except for the splotches of shadow cast by the trees. Passing by the orangery, I am reminded of another Paris, the Paris of Mom, of Gauguin, Paris of George Moore. I think of that terrible Spaniard who was then startling the world with his acrobatic leaps from style to style. I think of Spengler and of his terrible pronunciamentos, and I wonder if style, style in the grand manner, is done for. I say that my mind is occupied with these thoughts, but it is not true. It is only later, after I have crossed the Seine, after I have put behind me the carnival of lights, that I allow my mind to play with these ideas. For the moment I can think of nothing, except that I am a sentient being, stabbed by the miracle of these waters that reflect a forgotten world. All along the banks the trees lean heavily over the tarnished mirror. When the wind rises and fills them with a rustling murmur, they will shed a few tears and shiver as the water swirls by. I am suffocated by it. No one to whom I can communicate even a fraction of my feelings. The trouble with Irena is that she has a valise instead of a cunt. She wants fat letters to shove in her valise. Immense avec des choses inouïes. Lona now, she had a cunt. I know because she sent us some hairs from down below. Lona, a wild ass snuffing pleasure out of the wind. On every high hill she played the harlot and sometimes in telephone booths and toilets. She bought a bed for King Carol and a shaving mug with his initials on it. She lay in Tottenham Court Road with her dress pulled up and fingered herself. She used candles, Roman candles, and doorknobs, not a prick in the land big enough for her. Not one. Men went inside her and curled up. She wanted extension pricks, self-exploding rockets, hot boiling oil made of wax and creosote. She would cut off your prick and keep it inside her forever if you gave her permission. One cunt out of a million, Lona. A laboratory cunt and no litmus paper that could take her color. She was a liar, too, this Lona. She never bought a bed for her King Carol. She crowned him with a whiskey bottle, and her tongue was full of lice and tomorrows. Poor Carol. He could only curl up inside her and die. She drew a breath, and he fell out like a dead clam. Enormous, fat letters, avec des choses inouïes. A valise without straps, a hole without a key. She had a German mouth, French ears, Russian ass, cunt international. When the flag waved, it was red all the way back to the throat. You entered on the boulevard Jules Ferry and came out at the Porte de la Viette. You dropped your sweetbreads into the tumbrils, red tumbrils with two wheels, naturally. At the confluence of the Ourc and Marne, where the water sluices through the dikes and lies like glass under the bridges, Lona is lying there now, and the canal is full of glass and splinters. The mimosas weep, and there is a wet, foggy fart on the window panes. One cunt out of a million, Lona. All cunt and a glass ass in which you could read the history of the Middle Ages. It is the caricature of a man which Muldorf first presents. Thyroid eyes, Michelin lips, voice like pea soup. Under his vest he carries a little pear. However you look at him, it is always the same panorama. 
Netsuke snuff box, ivory handle, chess piece, fan, temple motif. He has fermented so long now that he is amorphous. Yeast despoiled of its vitamins, vase without a rubber plant. The females were sired twice in the ninth century and again during the Renaissance. He was carried through the great dispersions under yellow bellies and white. Long before the exodus, a totter spat in his blood. His dilemma is that of the dwarf. With his pineal eye he sees his silhouette projected on a screen of incommensurable size. His voice, synchronized to the shadow of a pinhead, intoxicates him. He hears a roar where others hear only a squeak. There is his mind. It is an amphitheater in which the actor gives a protean performance. Moldorf, multiform and unerring, goes through his roles, clown, juggler, contortionist, priest, lecher, montebank. The amphitheater is too small. He puts dynamite to it. The audience is drugged. He scotches it. I am trying ineffectually to approach Moldorf. It is like trying to approach God, for Moldorf is God. He has never been anything else. I am merely putting down words. I have had opinions about him which I have discarded. I have had other opinions which I am revising. I have pinned him down only to find that it was not a dung beetle I had in my hands, but a dragonfly. He has offended me by his coarseness and then overwhelmed me with his delicacy. He has been voluble to the point of suffocation, then quiet as the Jordan. When I see him trotting forward to greet me, his little paws outstretched, his eyes perspiring, I feel that I am meeting... No, this is not the way to go about it. Comme un ouf, dansant, sur un jet d'eau. He has only one cane, a mediocre one. In his pocket, scraps of paper containing prescriptions for Weltschmerz. He is cured now, and the little German girl who washed his feet is breaking her heart. It is like Mr. Nonentity toting his Gujarati dictionary everywhere. Inevitable for everyone, meaning, no doubt, indispensable. Borowski would find all this incomprehensible. Borowski has a different cane for each day in the week, and one for Easter. We have so many points in common that it is like looking at myself in a cracked mirror. I have been looking over my manuscripts, pages scrawled with revisions, pages of literature. This frightens me a little. It is so much like Moldorf. Only I am a Gentile, and Gentiles have a different way of suffering. They suffer without neuroses, and, as Sylvester says, a man who has never been afflicted with a neurosis does not know the meaning of suffering. I recall distinctly how I enjoyed my suffering. It was like taking a cub to bed with you. Once in a while he clawed you, and then you really were frightened. Ordinarily you had no fear. You could always turn him loose or chop his head off. There are people who cannot resist the desire to get into a cage with wild beasts and be mangled. They go in even without revolver or whip. Fear makes them fearless. For the Jew, the world is a cage filled with wild beasts. The door is locked and he is there without whip or revolver. His courage is so great that he does not even smell the dung in the corner. The spectators applaud, but he does not hear. The drama, he thinks, is going on inside the cage. The cage, he thinks, is the world. Standing there alone and helpless, the door locked, he finds that the lions do not understand his language. Not one lion has ever heard of Spinoza. Spinoza? Why, they can't even get their teeth into him. Give us meat, they roar, while he stands there petrified, his ideas frozen, his Weltenschauung, a trapeze out of reach. A single blow of the lion's paw, and his cosmogony is smashed. The lions, too, are disappointed. They expected blood, bones, gristle, sinews. They chew and chew, but the words are chickle, and chickle is indigestible. Chickle is a base over which you sprinkle sugar, pepsin, thyme, licorice. Chickle, when it is gathered by Chicleros, is okay. The Chicleros came over on the ridge of a sunken continent. They brought with them an algebraic language. In the Arizona desert, they met the Mongols of the north, glazed like eggplants. Time shortly after the earth had taken its gyroscopic lean, when the Gulf Stream was parting ways with the Japanese current. In the heart of the soil, they found tufa rock, they embroidered the very bowels of the earth with their language. 
they ate one another's entrails, and the forest closed in on them, on their bones and skulls, on their lace tufa. Their language was lost. Here and there one still finds the remnants of a menagerie, a brain plate covered with figures. What has all this to do with you, Moldorf? The word in your mouth is anarchy. Say it, Moldorf. I am waiting for it. Nobody knows when we shake hands the rivers that pour through our sweat. Whilst you are framing your words, your lips half-parted, the saliva gurgling in your cheeks, I have jumped halfway across Asia. Were I to take your cane, mediocre as it is, and poke a little hole in your side, I could collect enough material to fill the British Museum. We stand on five minutes and devour centuries. You are the sieve through which my anarchy strains, resolves itself into words. Behind the word is chaos. Each word a stripe, a bar, but there are not and never will be enough bars to make the mesh. In my absence, the window curtains have been hung. They have the appearance of Tyrolean tablecloths, dipped in Lysol. The room sparkles. I sit on the bed in a daze, thinking about man before his birth. Suddenly bells begin to toll, a weird, unearthly music, as if I had been translated to the steppes of Central Asia. Some ring out with a long, lingering roll, some erupt drunkenly, maudlinly. And now it is quiet again, except for a last note that barely grazes the silence of the night, just a faint, high gong snuffed out like a flame. I have made a silent compact with myself not to change a line of what I write. I am not interested in perfecting my thoughts nor my actions. Beside the perfection of Turgenev, I put the perfection of Dostoevsky. Is there anything more perfect than the eternal husband? Here then, in one and the same medium, we have two kinds of perfection. But in Van Gogh's letters, there is a perfection beyond either of these. It is the triumph of the individual over art. There is only one thing which interests me vitally now, and that is the recording of all that which is omitted in books. Nobody, so far as I can see, is making use of those elements in the air which give direction and motivation to our lives. Only the killers seem to be extracting from life some satisfactory measure of what they are putting into it. The age demands violence, but we are getting only abortive explosions. Revolutions are nipped in the bud or else succeed too quickly. Passion is quickly exhausted. Men fall back on ideas, comme d'habitude. Nothing is proposed that can last more than twenty-four hours. We are living a million lives in the space of a generation. In the study of entomology, or of deep sea life, or cellular activity, we derive more. The telephone interrupts this thought, which I should never have been able to complete. Someone is coming to rent the apartment. It looks as though it were finished, my life at the Villa Borghese. Well, I'll take up these pages and move on. Things will happen elsewhere. Things are always happening. It seems wherever I go there is drama. People are like lice. They get under your skin and bury themselves there. You scratch and scratch until the blood comes, but you can't get permanently deloused. Everywhere I go people are making a mess of their lives. Everyone has his private tragedy. It's in the blood now. Misfortune, ennui, grief suicide. The atmosphere is saturated with disaster, frustration, futility. Scratch and scratch until there's no skin left. However, the effect upon me is exhilarating. Instead of being discouraged or depressed, I enjoy it. I am crying for more and more disasters, for bigger calamities, for grander failures. I want the whole world to be out of whack. I want everyone to scratch himself to death. So fast and furiously am I compelled to live now that there is scarcely time to record even these fragmentary notes. After the telephone call, a gentleman and his wife arrived. I went upstairs to lie down during the transaction, lay there wondering what my next move would be. Surely not to go back to the fairy's bed and toss about all night, flicking breadcrumbs with my toes. That puking little bastard. If there's anything worse than being a fairy, it's being a miser. A timid, quaking little bugger who lived in constant fear of going broke some day, the 18th of March, perhaps, or the 25th of May, precisely. Coffee without milk or sugar, bread without butter, meat without gravy, or no meat at all, without this and without that, that dirty little miser. Open the bureau drawer one day and find money hidden away in a sock. 
over two thousand francs, and checks that he hadn't even cashed. Even that I wouldn't have minded so much if there weren't always coffee grounds in my beret and garbage on the floor to say nothing of the cold cream jars and the greasy towels and the sink always stopped up. I tell you, the little bastard, he smelled bad, except when he doused himself with a cologne. His ears were dirty, his eyes were dirty, his ass was dirty. He was double-jointed, asthmatic, lousy, picayune, morbid. I could have forgiven him everything if only he had handed me a decent breakfast. But a man who has two thousand francs hidden away in a dirty sock and refuses to wear a clean shirt or smear a little butter over his bread, such a man is not just a fairy nor even just a miser. He's an imbecile. But that's neither here nor there about the fairy. I'm keeping an ear open as to what's going on downstairs. It's a Mr. Wren and his wife who have called to look at the apartment. They're talking about taking it. Only talking about it, thank God. Mrs. Wren has a loose laugh, complications ahead. Now Mr. Wren is talking. His voice is raucous, scraping, booming, a heavy blunt weapon that wedges its way through flesh and bone and cartilage. Boris calls me down to be introduced. He is rubbing his hands like a pawnbroker. They are talking about a story Mr. Wren wrote, a story about a spavined horse. But I thought Mr. Wren was a painter. To be sure, says Boris with a twinkle in his eye, but in the winter time he writes, and he writes well, remarkably well. I try to induce Mr. Wren to talk, to say something, anything, to talk about the spavined horse if necessary, but Mr. Wren is almost inarticulate. When he essays to speak of those dreary months with the pen, he becomes unintelligible. Months and months he spends before setting a word to paper, and there are only three months of winter. What does he cogitate all those months and months of winter? So help me God, I can't see this guy as a writer. Yet Mrs. Wren says that when he sits down to it, the stuff just pours out. The talk drifts. It is difficult to follow Mr. Wren's mind because he says nothing. He thinks as he goes along, so Mrs. Wren puts it. Mrs. Wren puts everything about Mr. Wren in the loveliest light. He thinks as he goes along, very charming, charming indeed, as Borowski would say, but really very painful, particularly when the thinker is nothing but a spavined horse. Boris hands me money to buy liquor. Going for the liquor, I am already intoxicated. I know just how I'll begin when I get back to the house. Walking down the street, it commences, the grand speech inside me that's gurgling like Mrs. Wren's loose laugh. Seems to me she had a slight edge on already. Listens beautifully when she's tight. Coming out of the wine shop, I hear the urinal gurgling. Everything is loose and splashy. I want Mrs. Wren to listen. Boris is rubbing his hands again. Mr. Wren is still stuttering and spluttering. I have a bottle between my legs, and I'm shoving the corkscrew in. Mrs. Wren has her mouth parted expectantly. The wine is splashing between my legs, the sun is splashing through the bay window, and inside my veins there is a bubble and splash of a thousand crazy things that commence to gush out of me now, pell-mell. I'm telling them everything that comes to mind, everything that was bottled up inside me, and which Mrs. Wren's loose laugh has somehow released. With that bottle between my legs and the sun splashing through the window, I experience once again the splendor of those miserable days when I first arrived in Paris a bewildered, poverty-stricken individual who haunted the streets like a ghost at a banquet. Everything comes back to me in a rush, the toilets that wouldn't work, the prince who shined my shoes, the cinema splendide where I slept on the patron's overcoat, the bars in the window, the feeling of suffocation, the fat cockroaches, the drinking and carousing that went on between times, Rosé Canac and Naples dying in the sunlight dancing the streets on an empty belly, and now and then calling on strange people, Madame Delorme, for instance. How I ever got to Madame Delorme's, I can't imagine any more. But I got there, got inside somehow, past the butler, past the maid with her little white apron, got right inside the palace with my corduroy trousers and my hunting jacket, and not a button on my fly. Even now I can taste again the golden ambience of that room where Madame Delorme sat upon a throne in her mannish rig, the goldfish in the bowls, the maps of the ancient world, the beautifully bound books. I can feel again her heavy hand resting upon my shoulder, frightening me a little with her heavy lesbian air. More comfortable down below, in that thick stew pouring into the Gare Saint-Lazare, the whores in the doorways, seltzer bottles on every table a thick tide of semen flooding the gutters. 
nothing better between five and seven than to be pushed around in that throng, to follow a leg or a beautiful bust, to move along with the tide and everything whirling in your brain. A weird sort of contentment in those days. No appointments, no invitations for dinner, no program, no dough. The golden period when I had not a single friend. Each morning the dreary walk to the American Express, and each morning the inevitable answer from the clerk. Dashing here and there like a bedbug, gathering butts now and then, sometimes furtively, sometimes brazenly. Sitting down on a bench and squeezing my guts to stop the gnawing, or walking through the Jardin des Tuileries and getting an erection looking at the dumb statues. Or wandering along the Seine at night, wandering and wandering, and going mad with the beauty of it, the trees leaning to, the broken images in the water, the rush of the current under the bloody lights of the bridges, the women sleeping in doorways, sleeping on newspapers, sleeping in the rain. Everywhere the musty porches of the cathedrals and beggars and lice and old hags full of St. Vitus's dance. Pushcarts stacked up like wine barrels in the side streets, the smell of berries in the marketplace, and the old church surrounded with vegetables and blue arc lights, the gutters slippery with garbage, and women in satin pumps staggering through the filth and vermin at the end of an all-night souse. The Place Saint-Sulpice, so quiet and deserted, where toward midnight there came every night the woman with the busted umbrella and the crazy veil. Every night she slept there on a bench under her torn umbrella, the ribs hanging down, her dress turning green, her bony fingers and the odor of decay oozing from her body. And in the morning I'd be sitting there myself, taking a quiet snooze in the sunshine, cursing the goddamned pigeons gathering up the crumbs everywhere. Sans soupice. The fat belfries, the garish posters over the door, the candles flaming inside, the square so beloved of Anatole France, with that drone and buzz from the altar, the splash of the fountain, the pigeons cooing, the crumbs disappearing like magic, and only a dull rumbling in the hollow of the guts. Here I would sit, day after day, thinking of Germain, and that dirty little street near the Bastille where she lived, and that buzz-buzz going on behind the altar the buses whizzing by, the sun beating down into the asphalt, and the asphalt working into me and Germain, into the asphalt and all Paris in the big fat belfries. And it was down the Rue Bonaparte that only a year before Mona and I used to walk every night, after we had taken leave of Borowski, Saint-Sulpice not meaning much to me then, nor anything in Paris, washed out with talk, sick of faces, fed up with cathedrals and squares and menageries and what not picking up a book in the red bedroom and the cane chair uncomfortable, tired of sitting on my ass all day long, tired of red wallpaper, tired of seeing so many people jabbering away about nothing. The red bedroom and the trunk always open, her gowns lying about in a delirium of disorder. The red bedroom with my galoshes and canes, the notebooks I never touched, the manuscripts lying cold and dead, Paris meaning the Café Select, the Dom, the Flea Market, the American Express, Paris, meaning Borowski's canes, Borowski's hats, Borowski's gouaches, Borowski's prehistoric fish, and prehistoric jokes. In that Paris of twenty-eight, only one night stands out in my memory, the night before sailing for America, a rare night with Borowski slightly pickled and a little disgusted with me because I'm dancing with every slut in the place, but we're leaving in the morning. That's what I tell every cunt I grab hold of, leaving in the morning. That's what I'm telling the blonde with agate-colored eyes, and while I'm telling her, she takes my hand and squeezes it between her legs. In the lavatory I stand before the bowl with a tremendous erection. It seems light and heavy at the same time, like a piece of lead with wings on it. And while I'm standing there like that, two cunts sail in, Americans. I greet them cordially, prick in hand. They give me a wink and pass on. In the vestibule, as I'm buttoning my fly, I notice one of them waiting for her friend to come out of the can. The music is still playing, and maybe Mona will be coming to fetch me, or Borowski with his gold-knobbed cane, but I'm in her arms now, and she has hold of me, and I don't care who comes or what happens. We wriggle into the cabinet, and there I stand her up, slap up against the wall, and I try to get it into her, but it won't work, and so we sit down on the seat and try it that way, but it won't work either. No matter how we try it, it won't work. And all the while she's got hold of my prick, she's clutching it like a lifesaver, but it's no use. We're too hot, too eager. 
The music is still playing, and so we waltz out of the cabinet into the vestibule again, and as we're dancing there in the shithouse, I come all over her beautiful gown, and she's sore as hell about it. I stumble back to the table, and there's Borowski with his ruddy face, and Mona with her disapproving eye, and Borowski says, Let's all go to Brussels tomorrow. And we agree, and when we get back to the hotel, I vomit all over the place, in the bed, in the washbowl, over the suits and gowns, and the galoshes and canes, and the notebooks I never touched, and the manuscripts cold and dead. A few months later, the same hotel, the same room, we look out on the courtyard where the bicycles are parked, and there is the little room up above under the attic where some smart young Alec played the phonograph all day long and repeated clever little things at the top of his voice. I say we, but I'm getting ahead of myself, because Mona has been away a long time, and it's just today that I'm meeting her at the Gare Saint-Lazare. Toward evening I'm standing there with my face squeezed between the bars, but there's no Mona, and I read the cable over again, but it doesn't help any. I go back to the quarter, and just the same I put away a hearty meal. Strolling past the dom a little later, suddenly I see a pale, heavy face and burning eyes and the little velvet suit that I always adore, because under the soft velvet there were always her warm breasts, the marble legs, cool, firm, muscular. She rises up out of a sea of faces and embraces me, embraces me passionately. A thousand eyes, noses, fingers, legs, bottles, windows, purses, saucers, all glaring at us, and we in each other's arms, oblivious. I sit down beside her, and she talks, a flood of talk, wild, consumptive notes of hysteria, perversion, leprosy. I hear not a word because she is beautiful, and I love her, and now I am happy and willing to die. We walk down the Rue du Chateau, looking for Eugene, walk over the railroad bridge where I used to watch the trains pulling out and feel all sick inside, wondering where the hell she could be. Everything soft and enchanting as we walk over the bridge, smoke coming up between our legs, the tracks creaking, semaphores in our blood. I feel her body close to mine, all mine now, and I stop to rub my hands over the warm velvet. Everything around us is crumbling, crumbling, and the warm body under the warm velvet is aching for me. Back in the very same room, and fifty francs to the good, thanks to Eugene. I look out on the court, but the phonograph is silent. The trunk is open, and her things are lying around everywhere, just as before. She lies down on the bed with her clothes on. Once, twice, three times, four times. I'm afraid she'll go mad. In bed, under the blankets, how good to feel her body again. But for how long? Will it last this time? Already I have a presentiment that it won't. She talks to me so feverishly, as if there will be no tomorrow. Be quiet, Mona. Just look at me. Don't talk. Finally she drops off, and I pull my arm from under her. My eyes close. Her body is there beside me. It will be there till morning, surely. It was in February I pulled out of the harbor in a blinding snowstorm. The last glimpse I had of her was in the window waving goodbye to me. A man standing on the other side of the street at the corner, his hat pulled down over his eyes, his jowls resting on his lapels, a fetus watching me, a fetus with a cigar in its mouth. Mona at the window waving goodbye, white heavy face, hair streaming wild, and now it is a heavy bedroom, breathing regularly through the gills, sap still oozing from between her legs, a warm feline odor, and her hair in my mouth. My eyes are closed. We breathe warmly into each other's mouth, close together, America three thousand miles away. I never want to see it again. To have her here in bed with me, breathing on me, her hair in my mouth, I count that something of a miracle. Nothing can happen now till morning. I wake from a deep slumber to look at her. A pale light is trickling in. I look at her beautiful wild hair. I feel something crawling down my neck. I look at her again closely. Her hair is alive. I pull back the sheet. More of them. They are swarming over the pillow. It is a little after daybreak. We pack hurriedly and sneak out of the hotel. The cafes are still closed. We walk, and as we walk, we scratch ourselves. The day opens in milky whiteness, streaks of salmon-pink sky, snails leaving their shells. Paris. Paris. Everything happens here. Old crumbling walls and the pleasant sound of water running in the urinals. 
men licking their mustaches at the bar, shutters going up with a bang and little streams purling in the gutters. Amer piquant in huge scarlet letters, zigzag. Which way will we go, and why, or where, or what? Mona is hungry, her dress is thin. Nothing but evening wraps, bottles of perfume, barbaric earrings, bracelets, depilatories. We sit down in a billiard parlor on the Avenue du Maine and order hot coffee. The toilet is out of order. We shall have to sit some time before we can go to another hotel. Meanwhile, we pick bedbugs out of each other's hair. Nervous. Mona is losing her temper. Must have a bath. Must have this. Must have that. Must, must, must. How much money have you left? Money? Forgot all about that. Hotel des Etats Unis. An ascensor. We go to bed in broad daylight. When we get up, it is dark, and the first thing to do is to raise enough dough to send a cable to America. A cable to the fetus with the long, juicy cigar in his mouth. Meanwhile, there is the Spanish woman on the boulevard Raspail. She's always good for a warm meal. By morning, something will happen. At least we're going to bed together. No more bed bugs now. The rainy season has commenced. The sheets are immaculate. A new life opening up for me at the Villa Borghese. Only ten o'clock, and we have already had breakfast and been out for a walk. We have an Elsa here with us now. Step softly for a few days, cautions Boris. The day begins gloriously. A bright sky, a fresh wind, the houses newly washed. On our way to the post office, Boris and I discussed the book. The last book, which is going to be written anonymously. A new day is beginning. I felt it this morning as we stood before one of Dufresne's glistening canvases, a sort of déjeuner en team in the thirteenth century, sans vin. A fine, fleshy nude, solid, vibrant, pink as a fingernail, with glistening billows of flesh, all the secondary characteristics and a few of the primary. A body that sings, that has the moisture of dawn. A still life, only nothing is still, nothing dead here. The table creaks with food, it is so heavy it is sliding out of the frame. A thirteenth-century repast, with all the jungle notes that he has memorized so well. A family of gazelles and zebras nipping the fronds of the palms. And now we have Elsa. She was playing for us this morning while we were in bed. Step softly for a few days. Good. Elsa is the maid, and I am the guest, and Boris is the big cheese. A new drama is beginning. I'm laughing to myself as I write this. He knows what is going to happen, that lynx, Boris. He has a nose for things, too. Step softly. Boris is on pins and needles. At any moment now his wife may appear on the scene. She weighs well over a hundred and eighty pounds, that wife of his, and Boris is only a handful. There you have the situation. He tries to explain it to me on our way home at night. It is so tragic and so ridiculous at the same time that I am obliged to stop now and then and laugh in his face. Why do you laugh so? he says gently, and then he commences himself with that whimpering, hysterical note in his voice, like a helpless wretch who realizes suddenly that no matter how many frock coats he puts on, he will never make a man. He wants to run away, to take a new name. She can have everything, that cow, if only she leaves me alone he whines. But first the apartment has to be rented, and the deed signed, and a thousand other details for which his frock coat will come in handy. But the size of her, that's what really worries him. If we were to find her suddenly standing on the doorstep when we arrive, he would faint. That's how much he respects her. And so we've got to go easy with Elsa for a while. Elsa is only there to make breakfast, and to show the apartment. But Elsa is already undermining me. That German blood, those melancholy songs, coming down the stairs this morning with the fresh coffee in my nostrils, I was humming softly, Es wäre so schön gewesen. For breakfast, that. And in a little while, the English boy upstairs with his Bach. As Elsa says, he needs a woman. And Elsa needs something, too. I can feel it. I didn't say anything to Boris about it, but while he was cleaning his teeth this morning, Elsa was giving me an earful about Berlin, about the women who look so attractive from behind, and when they turn round... Wow! Syphilis! 
It seems to me that Elsa looks at me rather wistfully. Something left over from the breakfast table. This afternoon we were writing, back to back, in the studio. She had begun a letter to her lover, who was in Italy. The machine got jammed. Boris had gone to look at a cheap room he will take as soon as the apartment is rented. There was nothing for it but to make love to Elsa. She wanted it. And yet I felt a little sorry for her. She had only written the first line to her lover. I read it out of the corner of my eye as I bent over her. But it couldn't be helped. That damned German music, so melancholy, so sentimental, it undermined me. And then her beady little eyes, so hot and sorrowful at the same time. After it was over, I asked her to play something for me. She's a musician, Elsa, even though it sounded like broken pots and skulls clanking. She was weeping, too, as she played. I don't blame her. Everywhere the same thing, she says. Everywhere a man, and then she has to leave, and then there's an abortion, and then a new job, and then another man, and nobody gives a fuck about her except to use her. All this after she's played Schumann for me. Schumann, that slobbery, sentimental German bastard. Somehow I feel sorry as hell for her, and yet I don't give a damn. A cunt who can play as she does ought to have better sense than be tripped up by every guy with a big putz who happens to come along. But that Schumann gets into my blood. She's still sniffling, Elsa, but my mind is far away. I'm thinking of Tanya and how she claws away at her adagio. I'm thinking of lots of things that are gone and buried. Thinking of a summer afternoon in Greenpoint when the Germans were romping over Belgium and we had not yet lost enough money to be concerned over the rape of a neutral country. A time when we were still innocent enough to listen to poets and to sit around a table in the twilight rapping for departed spirits. All that afternoon and evening the atmosphere is saturated with German music. The whole neighborhood is German, more German even than Germany. We were brought up on Schumann and Hugo Wolf and sauerkraut and Kimmel and potato dumplings. Toward evening we're sitting around a big table with the curtains drawn and some fool two-headed wench is rapping for Jesus Christ. We're holding hands under the table, and the dame next to me has two fingers in my fly. And finally we lie on the floor behind the piano while someone sings a dreary song. The air is stifling, and her breath is boozy. The pedal is moving up and down, stiffly, automatically, a crazy, futile movement, like a tower of dung that takes twenty-seven years to build but keeps perfect time. I pull her over me with the sounding board in my ears. The room is dark, and the carpet is sticky with the kimmel that has been spilled about. Suddenly it seems as if the dawn were coming. It is like water purling over ice, and the ice is blue with a rising mist, glaciers sunk in emerald green, chamois and antelope, golden groupers, sea cows mooching along, and the amber jack leaping over the arctic rim. Elsa is sitting in my lap. Her eyes are like little belly buttons. I look at her large mouth, so wet and glistening, and I cover it. She is humming now. Es wär so schön gewesen. Ah, Elsa, you don't know yet what that means to me. Your trompeter von Seckingen, German singing societies, Schwaben Hall, the Turnverein, links um, rechts um, and then a whack over the ass with the end of a rope. Ah, the Germans. They take you all over like an omnibus. They give you indigestion. In the same night one cannot visit the morgue, the infirmary, the zoo, the signs of the zodiac, the limbos of philosophy, the caves of epistemology, the arcana of Freud and Steckel. On the merry-go-round one doesn't get anywhere, whereas with the Germans one can go from Vega to Lope de Vega, all in one night, and come away as foolish as Parsifal. As I say, the day began gloriously. It was only this morning that I became conscious again of this physical Paris of which I had been unaware for weeks. Perhaps it is because the book has begun to grow inside me. I am carrying it around with me everywhere. I walk through the streets big with child, and the cops escort me across the street. Women get up to offer me their seats. Nobody pushes me rudely any more. I am pregnant. I waddle awkwardly, my big stomach pressed against the weight of the world. It was this morning on our way to the post office that we gave the book its final imprimatur. We have evolved a new cosmogony of literature, Boris and I. It is to be a new Bible, the last book. All those who have anything to say will say it here, anonymously. We will exhaust the age. 
After us, not another book, not for a generation at least. Heretofore we had been digging in the dark, with nothing but instinct to guide us. Now we shall have a vessel in which to pour the vital fluid, a bomb which, when we throw it, will set off the world. We shall put into it enough to give the writers of tomorrow their plots, their dramas, their poems, their myths, their sciences. The world will be able to feed on it for a thousand years to come. It is colossal in its pretentiousness. The thought of it almost shatters us. For a hundred years or more the world, our world, has been dying, and not one man in these last hundred years or so has been crazy enough to put a bomb up the asshole of creation and set it off. The world is rotting away, dying piecemeal, but it needs the coup de grace, it needs to be blown to smithereens. Not one of us is intact, and yet we have in us all the continents and the seas between the continents and the birds of the air. We are going to put it down, the evolution of this world which has died but which has not been buried. We are swimming on the face of time, and all else has drowned, is drowning, or will drown. It will be enormous, the book. There will be oceans of space in which to move about, to perambulate, to sing, to dance, to climb, to bathe, to leap somersaults, to whine, to rape, to murder. A cathedral, a veritable cathedral, in the building of which everybody will assist who has lost his identity. There will be masses for the dead, prayers, confessions, hymns, a moaning and a chattering, a sort of murderous insouciance. There will be rose windows and gargoyles and acolytes and pallbearers. You can bring your horses in and gallop through the aisles. You can butt your head against the walls. They won't give. You can pray in any language you choose, or you can curl up outside and go to sleep. It will last a thousand years at least, this cathedral, and there will be no replica, for the builders will be dead, and the formula too. We will have postcards made and organize tours. We will build a town around it and set up a free commune. We have no need for genius. Genius is dead. We have need for strong hands, for spirits who are willing to give up the ghost and put on flesh. The day is moving along at a fine tempo. I am up on the balcony at Tanya's place. The drama is going on down below in the drawing room. The dramatist is sick, and from above his scalp looks more scabrous than ever. His hair is made of straw, his ideas are straw, his wife too is straw, though still a little damp. The whole house is made of straw. Here I am, up on the balcony, waiting for Boris to arrive. My last problem, breakfast, is gone. I have simplified everything. If there are any new problems, I can carry them in my rucksack along with my dirty wash. I am throwing away all my sous. What need have I for money? I am a writing machine. The last screw has been added. The thing flows. Between me and the machine there is no estrangement. I am the machine. They have not told me yet what the new drama is about, but I can sense it. They are trying to get rid of me. Yet here I am for my dinner, even a little earlier than they expected. I have informed them where to sit, what to do. I ask them politely if I shall be disturbing them, but what I really mean, and they know it well, is will you be disturbing me? No, you blissful cockroaches, you are not disturbing me, you are nourishing me. I see you sitting there close together, and I know there is a chasm between you. Your nearness is the nearness of planets. I am the void between you. If I withdraw, there will be no void for you to swim in. Tanya is in a hostile mood. I can feel it. She resents my being filled with anything but herself. She knows by the very caliber of my excitement that her value is reduced to zero. She knows that I did not come this evening to fertilize her. She knows there is something germinating inside me which will destroy her. She is slow to realize, but she is realizing it. Sylvester looks more content. He will embrace her this evening at the dinner table. Even now he is reading my manuscript, preparing to inflame my ego, to set my ego against hers. It will be a strange gathering this evening. The stage is being set. I hear the tinkle of the glasses. The wine is being brought out, there will be bumpers downed, and Sylvester, who is ill, will come out of his illness. It was only last night at Kronstadt's that we projected this setting. It was ordained that the women must suffer, that off stage there should be more terror and violence, more disasters, more suffering, more woe and misery. 
It is no accident that propels people like us to Paris. Paris is simply an artificial stage, a revolving stage that permits the spectator to glimpse all phases of the conflict. Of itself, Paris initiates no dramas. They are begun elsewhere. Paris is simply an obstetrical instrument that tears the living embryo from the womb and puts it in the incubator. Paris is the cradle of artificial births. Rocking here in the cradle, each one slips back into his soil. One dreams back to Berlin, New York, Chicago, Vienna, Minsk. Vienna is never more Vienna than in Paris. Everything is raised to apotheosis. The cradle gives up its babes and new ones take their places. You can read here on the walls where Zola lived and Balzac and Dante and Strindberg and everybody who ever was anything. Everyone has lived here some time or other. Nobody dies here. They are talking downstairs. Their language is symbolic. The word struggle enters into it. Sylvester, the sick dramatist, is saying, I am just reading the manifesto, and Tanya says, Whose? Yes, Tanya, I heard you. I am up here writing about you, and you divine it well. Speak more, that I may record you. For when we go to table, I shall not be able to make any notes. Suddenly Tanya remarks, There is no prominent hall in this place. Now what does that mean, if anything? They are putting up pictures now. That too is to impress me. See, they wish to say, We are at home here, living the conjugal life, making the home attractive. We will even argue a little about the pictures, for your benefit. And Tanya remarks again, How the eye deceives one. Ah, Tanya, what things you say. Go on, carry out this farce a little longer. I am here to get the dinner you promised me. I enjoy this comedy tremendously. And now Sylvester takes the lead. He is trying to explain one of Borowski's gouaches. Come here, do you see? One of them is playing the guitar. The other is holding a girl in his lap. True, Sylvester, very true. Borowski and his guitars, the girls in his lap. Only one never quite knows what it is he holds in his lap, or whether it is really a man playing the guitar. Soon, Moldorf will be trotting in on all fours, and Boris with that helpless little laugh of his. There will be a golden pheasant for dinner, and Anjou, and short, fat cigars. And Kronstadt, when he gets the latest news, will live a little harder, a little brighter, for five minutes, and then he will subside again into the humus of his ideology, and perhaps a poem will be born, a big, golden bell of a poem without a tongue. Had to knock off for an hour or so, another customer to look at the apartment. Upstairs, the bloody Englishman is practicing his Bach. It is imperative now, when someone comes to look at the apartment, to run upstairs and ask the pianist to lay off for a while. Elsa is telephoning the greengrocer. The plumber is putting a new seat on the toilet bowl. Whenever the doorbell rings, Boris loses his equilibrium. In the excitement, he has dropped his glasses. He is on his hands and knees. His frock coat is dragging the floor. It is a little like the Grand Guignol, the starving poet come to give the butcher's daughter lessons. Every time the phone rings, the poet's mouth waters. Mallarmé sounds like a sirloin steak, Victor Hugo like foie de veau. Elsa is ordering a delicate little lunch for Boris, a nice juicy little pork chop, she says. I see a whole flock of pink hams lying cold on the marble, wonderful hams cushioned in white fat. I have a terrific hunger, though we've only had breakfast a few minutes ago. It's the lunch that I'll have to skip. It's only Wednesdays that I eat lunch, thanks to Borowski. Elsa is still telephoning. She forgot to order a piece of bacon. Yes, a nice little piece of bacon. Not too fatty, she says. Zut allures. Throw in some sweetbreads. Throw in some mountain oysters and some psst clams. Throw in some fried liverwurst while you're at it. I could gobble up the fifteen hundred plays of Lope de Vega in one sitting. It is a beautiful woman who has come to look at the apartment. An American, of course. I stand at the window with my back to her, watching a sparrow pecking at a fresh turd. Amazing how easily the sparrow is provided for. It is raining a bit, and the drops are very big. I used to think a bird couldn't fly if its wings got wet. Amazing how these rich dames come to Paris and find all the swell studios, a little talent, and a big purse. If it rains, they have a chance to display their brand new slickers. 
Food is nothing. Sometimes they're so busy gadding about that they haven't time for lunch. Just a little sandwich, a wafer at the Café de la Paix or the Ritz bar. For the daughters of gentlefolk only, that's what it says at the old studio of Pouvy de Chavin, happened to pass there the other day, rich American cunts with paint boxes slung over their shoulders, a little talent and a fat purse. The sparrow is hopping frantically from one cobblestone to another, truly Herculean efforts if you stop to examine closely. Everywhere there is food lying about, in the gutter, I mean. The beautiful American woman is inquiring about the toilet. The toilet? Let me show you, you velvet-snooted gazelle. The toilet, you say? Paris, madame. N'oubliez pas que la place numorte sont réservée aux mutilés de la guerre. Boris is rubbing his hands. He is putting the finishing touches to the deal. The dogs are barking in the courtyard. They bark like wolves. Upstairs, Mrs. Melverness is moving the furniture around. She had nothing to do all day. She's bored. If she finds a crumb of dirt anywhere, she cleans the whole house. There's a bunch of green grapes on the table and a bottle of wine. Vin de choix, ten degrees. Yes, says Boris. I could make a washstand for you. Just come here, please. Yes, this is the toilet. There's one upstairs, too, of course. Yes, a thousand francs a month. You don't care much for a trio, you say. No, this is it. It needs a new washer, that's all. She's going in a minute now. Boris hasn't even introduced me this time. The son of a bitch. Whenever it's a rich cunt, he forgets to introduce me. In a few minutes, I'll be able to sit down again and type. Somehow I don't feel like it any more today. My spirit is dribbling away. She may come back in an hour or so and take the chair from under my ass. How the hell can a man write when he doesn't know where he's going to sit the next half hour? If this rich bastard takes the place, I won't even have a place to sleep. It's hard to know when you're in such a jam which is worse, not having a place to sleep or not having a place to work. One can sleep almost anywhere, but one must have a place to work. Even if it's not a masterpiece you're doing, even a bad novel requires a chair to sit on and a bit of privacy. These rich cunts never think of a thing like that. Whenever they want to lower their soft behinds, there's always a chair standing ready for them. Last night we left Sylvester and his god sitting together before the hearth. Sylvester in his pajamas, Moldorf with a cigar between his lips. Sylvester is peeling an orange. He puts the peel on the couch cover. Moldorf draws closer to him. He asks permission to read again that brilliant parody, The Gates of Heaven. We are getting ready to go, Boris and I. We are too gay for this sick-room atmosphere. Tanya is going with us. She is gay because she is going to escape. Boris is gay because the god in Moldorf is dead. I am gay because it is another act we are going to put on. Moldorf's voice is reverent. Can I stay with you, Sylvester, until you go to bed? He has been staying with him for the last six days, buying medicine, running errands for Tanya, comforting, consoling, guarding the portals against malevolent intruders like Boris and his scalawags. He is like a savage who has discovered that his idol was mutilated during the night. There he sits at the idol's feet with breadfruit and grease and jabberwocky prayers. His voice goes out unctuously. His limbs are already paralyzed. To Tanya he speaks as if she were a priestess who had broken her vows. You must make yourself worthy. Sylvester is your god. And while Sylvester is upstairs suffering, he has a little wheeze in his chest. The priest and the priestess devour the food. You are polluting yourself, he says, the gravy dripping from his lips. He has the capacity for eating and suffering at the same time. While he fends off the dangerous ones, he puts out his fat little paw and strokes Tanya's hair. I'm beginning to fall in love with you. You are like my fanny. In other respects, it has been a fine day for Moldorf. A letter arrived from America. Mo is getting A's in everything. Murray is learning to ride the bicycle. The Victrola was repaired. You can see from the expression on his face that there were other things in the letter besides report cards and velocipedes. You can be sure of it because this afternoon he bought 325 francs worth of jewelry for his fanny. In addition, he wrote her a 20-page letter. 
The garçon brought him page after page, filled his fountain pen, served his coffee and cigars, fanned him a little when he perspired, brushed the crumbs from the table, lit his cigar when it went out, bought stamps for him, danced on him, pirouetted, salamed, broke his spine damn near. The tip was fat, bigger and fatter than a Corona Corona. Moldorf probably mentioned it in his diary. It was for Fanny's sake. The bracelet and the earrings, they were worth every sou he spent. Better to spend it on Fanny than waste it on little strumpets like Germain and Odette. Yes, he told Tanya so. He showed her his trunk. It is crammed with gifts for Fanny and for Mo and Murray. My Fanny is the most intelligent woman in the world. I have been searching and searching to find a flaw in her, but there's not one. She's perfect. I'll tell you what Fanny can do. She plays bridge like a shark. She's interested in Zionism. You give her an old hat, for instance, and see what she can do with it. A little twist here, a ribbon there, and voila, quelque chose de beau. Do you know what is perfect bliss? To sit beside Fanny when Mo and Murray have gone to bed and listen to the radio. She sits there so peacefully. I am rewarded for all my struggles and heartaches in just watching her. She listens intelligently. When I think of your stinking Montparnasse and then of my evenings in Bay Ridge with Fanny after a big meal, I tell you there is no comparison. A simple thing like food, the children, the soft lamps, and Fanny sitting there a little tired but cheerful, contented, heavy with bread. We just sit there for hours without saying a word. That's bliss. Today she writes me a letter, not one of those dull stock report letters. She writes me from the heart, in language that even my little Murray could understand. She's delicate about everything, Fanny. She says that the children must continue their education, but the expense worries her. It will cost a thousand bucks to send little Murray to school. Mo, of course, will get a scholarship, but little Murray? That little genius, Murray? What are we going to do about him? I wrote Fanny not to worry. Send Murray to school, I said. What's another thousand dollars? I'll make more money this year than ever before. I'll do it for little Murray because he's a genius, that kid. I should like to be there when Fanny opens the trunk. See, Fanny, this is what I bought in Budapest from an old Jew. This is what they wear in Bulgaria. It's pure wool. This belonged to the Duke of something or other. No, you don't wind it. You put it in the sun. This I want you to wear, Fanny, when we go to the opera. Wear it with that comb I showed you. And this, Fanny, is something Tanya picked up for me. She's a little bit on your type. And Fanny is sitting there on the settee, just as she was in the oleograph, with Mo on one side of her and little Murray, Murray the genius, on the other. Her fat legs are a little too short to reach the floor. Her eyes have a dull permanganate glow. Breasts like ripe red cabbage, they bobble a little when she leans forward. But the sad thing about her is that the juice has been cut off. She sits there like a dead storage battery. Her face is out of plumb. It needs a little animation, a sudden spurt of juice to bring it back into focus. Moldorf is jumping around in front of her like a fat toad. His flesh quivers. He slips, and it is difficult for him to roll over again on his belly. She prods him with her thick toes. His eyes protrude a little further. Kick me again, Fanny. That was good. She gives him a good prod this time. It leaves a permanent dent in his paunch. His face is close to the carpet. The waddles are joggling in the nap of the rug. He livens up a bit, flips around, springs from furniture to furniture. Fanny, you are marvelous! He is sitting now on her shoulder. He bites a little piece from her ear, just a little tip from the lobe where it doesn't hurt. But she's still dead, all storage battery and no juice. He falls on her lap and lies there quivering like a toothache. He is all warm now and helpless. His belly glistens like a patent leather shoe. In the sockets of his eyes, a pair of fancy vest buttons. Unbutton my eyes, Fanny. I want to see you better. Fanny carries him to bed and drops a little hot wax over his eyes. She puts rings around his navel and a thermometer up his ass. She places him, and he quivers again. Suddenly he's dwindled, shrunk completely out of sight. She searches all over for him, in her intestines, everywhere. Something is tickling her. She doesn't know where exactly. The bed is full of toads and fancy vest buttons. Fanny, where are you? Something is tickling her. She can't say where. 
The buttons are dropping off the bed. The toads are climbing the walls. A tickling and a tickling. Fanny, take the wax out of my eyes. I want to look at you. But Fanny is laughing, squirming with laughter. There is something inside her, tickling and tickling. She'll die laughing if she doesn't find it. Fanny, the trunk is full of beautiful things. Fanny, do you hear me? Fanny is laughing, laughing like a fat worm. Her belly is swollen with laughter. Her legs are getting blue. Oh, God, Morris, there is something tickling me. I can't help it. Sunday. Left the Villa Borghese a little before noon, just as Boris was getting ready to sit down to lunch. I left out of a sense of delicacy, because it really pains Boris to see me sitting there in the studio with an empty belly. Why he doesn't invite me to lunch with him, I don't know. He says he can't afford it, but that's no excuse. Anyway, I'm delicate about it. If it pains him to eat alone in my presence, it would probably pain him more to share his meal with me. It's not my place to pry into his secret affairs. Dropped in at the Kronstadt's, and they were eating, too, a young chicken with wild rice. Pretended that I had eaten already, but I could have torn the chicken from the baby's hands. This is not just false modesty. It's a kind of perversion, I'm thinking. Twice they asked me if I wouldn't join them. No! No! Wouldn't even accept a cup of coffee after the meal. I'm delicate. I am. On the way out... I cast a lingering glance at the bones lying on the baby's plate. There was still meat on them. Prowling around aimlessly, a beautiful day so far. The Rue de Bucci is alive, crawling. The bars wide open and the curbs lined with bicycles. All the meat and vegetable markets are in full swing, arms loaded with truck, bandaged in newspapers. A fine Catholic Sunday, in the morning at least. High noon, and here I am standing on an empty belly at the confluence of all these crooked lanes that reek with the odor of food. Opposite me is the Hôtel de Louisiane, a grim old hostelry known to the bad boys of the Rue de Bucci in the good old days. Hotels and food, and I'm walking about like a leper with crabs gnawing at my entrails. On Sunday mornings, there's a fever in the streets. Nothing like it anywhere except perhaps on the east side or down around Chatham Square. The Rue de la Chaude is seething. The streets twist and turn at every angle a fresh hive of activity, long queues of people with vegetables under their arms, turning in here and there with crisp, sparkling appetites. Nothing but food, 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 makes one delirious. Past the square de Furstenberg looks different now at high noon. The other night when I passed by, it was deserted, bleak, spectral. In the middle of the square, four black trees that have not yet begun to blossom, intellectual trees, nourished by the paving stones. Like T.S. Eliot's verse, Here, by God, if Marie Laurence ever brought her lesbians out into the open, would be the place for them to commune. Très lesbien, ici. Sterile, hybrid, dry as Boris's heart. In the little garden adjoining the Église Saint-Germain are a few dismounted gargoyles, monsters that jut forward with a terrifying plunge. On the benches, other monsters, old people, idiots, cripples, epileptics, snoozing there quietly, waiting for the dinner bell to ring. At the gallery Zac across the way, some imbecile has made a picture of the cosmos on the flat, a painter's cosmos, full of odds and ends, bric-a-bric, in the lower left-hand corner, however, there's an anchor and a dinner bell. Salute. Salute, O oh cosmos. Still prowling around, mid-afternoon, guts rattling, beginning to rain now. Notre Dame rises tomb-like from the water. The gargoyles lean far out over the lace facade. They hang there like an e-day fix in the mind of a monomaniac. An old man with yellow whiskers approaches me, has some Jaworski nonsense in his hand comes up to me with his head thrown back and the rain splashing in his face turns the golden sands to mud. Bookstore with some of Raoul Dufy's drawings in the window. 
drawings of charwomen with rose bushes between their legs, a treatise on the philosophy of Joan Miro. The philosophy, mind you. In the same window, a man cut in slices. Chapter 1, the man in the eyes of his family. Chapter 2, the same in the eyes of his mistress. Chapter 3, no chapter 3. Have to come back tomorrow for chapters 3 and 4. Every day the window trimmer turns a fresh page. A man cut in slices. You can't imagine how furious I am not to have thought of a title like that. Where is this bloke who writes, The same in the eyes of his mistress, The same in the eyes of... The same... Where is this guy? Who is he? I want to hug him. I wish to Christ I had had enough brains to think of a title like that, instead of Crazy Cock and the other fool things I invented. Well, fuck a duck. I congratulate him just the same. I wish him luck with his fine title. Here's another slice for you, for your next book. Ring me up some day. I'm living at the Villa Borghese. We're all dead, or dying, or about to die. We need good titles. We need meat, slices and slices of meat. Juicy tenderloins, porterhouse steaks, kidneys, mountain oysters, sweetbreads. Some day, when I'm standing at the corner of 42nd Street and Broadway, I'm going to remember this title, and I'm going to put down everything that goes on in my noodle. Caviar, raindrops, axle grease, vermicelli, liverwurst, slices and slices of it. And I'll tell no one why, after I had put everything down, I suddenly went home and chopped the baby to pieces. An oct gratuit pour vous, cher mon cher, si bien coupé en tranche. How a man can wander about all day on an empty belly and even get an erection once in a while is one of those mysteries which are too easily explained by the anatomists of the soul. On a Sunday afternoon, when the shutters are down and the proletariat possesses the street in a kind of dumb torpor, there are certain thoroughfares which remind one of nothing less than a big, cankerous cock laid open longitudinally. And it is just these highways the Rue Saint-Denis, for instance, or the Faubourg du Temple, which attract one irresistibly, much as in the old days, around Union Square or the upper reaches of the Bowery. One was drawn to the dime museums where in the show windows there were displayed wax reproductions of various organs of the body eaten away by syphilis and other venereal diseases. The city sprouts out like a huge organism diseased in every part, the beautiful thoroughfares only a little less repulsive because they have been drained of their pus 